Hello, my name is Andrew Erickson from DPS Telecom, and this is how to remotely monitor your trackside cabinets and telecom sites. This is a presentation that I've delivered for a few different rail conferences, and it focuses mainly on making sure that you can remotely manage all of your infrastructure across your rail territory. As a railroad, you necessarily cover a lot of ground, and so it's important to be able to see what's going on without having people driving around, having all your technicians in disarray and not knowing what's going on. It's going to help you keep service online and do more with the resources you have. So first up, why should you actually listen to me? I have been at DPS Telecom for 12 years. We are a remote monitoring manufacturer, so I deal with this kind of thing on a daily basis. And to get these slides together, I interviewed our rail clients and I have real quotations from them about the kind of problems they faced and the solutions that they discovered. I did also learn as I tried to do my interviews that rail company legal departments are pretty concerned about security and that's probably legitimate. So I have censored somewhat my rail client list. So here are some of the names that I can show you and some of the ones that I couldn't are redacted, but it should give you a sense of the kind of names that DPS has worked with over the years. And you'll also notice that the quotations aren't specifically identified. So they are real world, they are from specific people at these railroads. I just don't identify which company they come from. So one important point before we get going here, telecom monitoring is quite universal. So the challenge of monitoring your telecom network, if you're at a railroad, very similar to what somebody at a telco or at a utility or a, or a police and fire radio network operator. It's the same kind of thing that they have to do. So I may also pull advice and guidance that has been useful in those industries because realistically the challenge that you're facing is very similar to the ones they are. So now, starting at the very basics, why is monitoring so important? What I heard from our rail clients is that first, we have a lot of unmanned locations, and that's true. These are small little huts and enclosures. You don't have people there virtually any of the time. So you need to know what's going on. And you have to have visibility of all of your field equipment. That's key. You can't pick and choose, well, this is important, but I don't need to monitor that. You wanna have everything of any real significance that needs to be monitored. And then the final thing I heard was that we move information as well as moving trains. And I just kind of like that phrasing. So I thought I'd toss that in there. So really the question you need to ask yourself is does this sound like you? And here's a quote. The way I found out something went down was I got a phone call and I had lots of them. They were constant every week. It was a very crude form of monitoring. And that word crude really resonated with me. This is what happens if you don't have good visibility you're getting people who you should be serving and they're calling you to tell you that they're dissatisfied, whether that's other people in your company in another department, or it's even your customers, the people you're serving. You don't wanna be having other people tell you how you're getting things wrong. You wanna know about issues and you wanna take care of them before they become big problems for anyone. You might also be wondering, how in the world am I gonna satisfy the mandate I have to improve efficiency, do more with less? That seems to be what everybody's facing nowadays. If you're struggling with how you're gonna pull that off, a lot of these tips are gonna help. And then lastly, you might be thinking, well, monitoring isn't the only thing I do. I do 20 different things and I just don't have the expertise in this one area. Well, this presentation should help you in that regard as well. So what if instead of being reactive in that way, you could be proactive? You'd know what was failing right as it happened within a few seconds. You'd know about your environmental levels, so whether or not the HVAC out at your sites was keeping everything cool enough, and whether the, there was too much humidity or water on the floor, some vandal broke in, actually heard about some sites way up north where it's quite remote, where you'd have people uh, shooting at enclosures, a hunter got bored, and so who knows what can happen out at some of your remote locations, and you need to know about those. And what if you could offer better service? What if you could have improved safety and fewer delays and improved systems like PA addresses, ticketing, just everything that rides on the telecom network is improved when you do a better job with your remote monitoring because you're gonna keep those systems on and fully functional much more of the time. You're almost never gonna have downtime if you do this correctly. So before we really get into it, I do wanna make sure you have a basic understanding of the kind of architecture we're talking about. So step one would be the RTU, and that's down low on the diagram. And that's gonna be a device, a remote terminal unit or remote telemetry unit. This sits out at the site and it's gonna collect data from sensors. It's gonna collect equipment alarms. 
and you're going to bring all that data in and this is a smart device that's going to be connected to the network and this is the first part of your monitoring system. It's really the front line. So if you have 10 or fewer locations, and I've actually talked to a, quite a few municipal radios that that's their situation, they might have three or four locations, the RTUs can generally send you a direct notification. And that might be an email, it might be SMS, some will even call you with a voice message to let you know what's happening, and that might be enough. But as you get more than that, you're gonna need some kind of an aggregator, and that's where master stations come in. So a master is pulling together data from Every one of your RTUs, you might have 50, you might have 100, however many it is, it's going to pull all that data and it's going to put it onto some kind of a view, whether it's a map view or you can see some analog gauges here, whether it's a list, you're going to have it visible to you at some level. And you can see the stacks of screens here indicate that there are multiple users supported. So you might have one person monitoring one map and another person monitoring another region or however big your network is, you're going to have a certain number of people looking at it. And if you have a very large network, you might actually have one master that pipes up protocol to another. So in this case, this team on master station is good at collecting a lot of legacy equipment and then converting it to something more useful and modern and then sending it up to another master. All right, so that's enough introduction. Let's get into it. These are 11 real world tips for your remote monitoring. First one, know everything about your environmentals. If your temperature gets out of whack, nothing's gonna work. So temperature, humidity, power, and that takes a couple forms. How are your generators doing? How are your batteries? How is commercial power? Door status, that's probably the least expensive thing. A door contact is just a couple dollars. You hook that up, normally closed your RTU, you're monitoring the door. And then motion or intrusion, you might have a couple different motion sensors. You can even do outdoor. If you wanna see, is somebody maybe messing around with the door? Have they gotten through a fence? And then you probably want to have some inside the site as well. You can see the quote down at the bottom. We know the environmental conditions of each site. Temperature, humidity, power, door status. We know if a door got left open or if there's a possible intrusion. And that's a good point. Uh, prop doors can actually be a common problem. So you can have an employee maybe forget. And before they get home, you can give them a call and say, hey, that site you just left three minutes ago, you propped the door open. So you better go back there because that's a security risk. Number two, you need to be able to get notifications wherever you are. So if you're in the knock and you're looking at a big display like the map here, well, that might be fine. That's great. You're in the office today. You can look at that screen. But what happens when you leave? This is where you're going to start to rely on things like emails going to your phone, text messages to your phone, being able to use your phone to get into a mobile web application, or even receive voice calls over your phone. These are all things that allow you to get out of the knock center and especially if you're a medium-sized company or a small company, you may not have a 24-7 knock that's checking alarms all the time. So you need to have some ability after hours especially to get alarm information delivered to you. And so you want to choose a system that is going to be able to send you the notifications that you want. One person at a rail agency I talked to said, now we're to the point where we get alerts on everything. I get emails on my cell phone and we know what's going on everywhere. And that's really the dream. You want to have situational awareness of everything all the time. Number three, anything can be monitored. And I gave you one example here. This is propane vaporization. And this deals with the fact that when it gets very cold, your propane won't actually boil in the tank and then it won't be available for the generator to burn. So this is one system that we had developed for a very specific requirement at a very cold location. And what happens is you have four tanks, two of them are shown, and there's two others that aren't pictured here. And they all need to be around 50% when it gets really cold because that's where the surface area is the highest. So the system just automatically says, well, this one is a little low, so we'll leave it here. The more we drain it, the less surface area we're going to have. But this one that's still at 80%, we need to start using some of this propane because as it gets colder, it's going to get harder and harder for it to boil. So it's a very unique scenario, but it's just serving to indicate that no matter what you've got going on, what you want to do, if you find the right manufacturer and you find the right equipment and you work it out, you can get something that's customized for exactly what you need because nothing you're doing is that unusual. So a smart manufacturer is going to see if this is something that you need, somebody else is going to need it, so I guess I should build it. And that really leads me into number four, buy from a partner. Your network is different than every other network on the planet. You need to have some amount of customization, and that might just be 
okay, well, my RTU should, can be one of a couple of sizes. It doesn't mean that we have to fully customize everything, but you should at least have a good catalog to pick from. And you don't want to try to get into what we call the solution stack hack, which is where you try to clue something together on your own that has no support, no user manual, and you better hope that it's not successful in your own small section of your network because if it is, you are going to become the designated support person throughout your company to be working on that, and it's going to pull you away from everything else. So you do want to find somebody who you can really use as your engineering department. Give them a challenge and tell them this is what I need and have them build it for you. And when you get it, you're going to have tech support, you're going to have a user manual. It's a much better way to go than trying to hack something together yourself. One of our clients was quoted as saying down at the bottom, being able to work with the engineering guys has been amazing. They've been able to design exactly what we need. That's really what we try to do all the time. Number five, monitor site weather before truck rolls. You can install weather stations, which are essentially just a bundle of an anemometer for wind speed. You have a weather vane to tell what direction the wind's moving. You might have temperature and humidity. And what that's going to tell you is if you're driving out to a site, what are the conditions going to be like? Are you going to have snow? If you're taking a helicopter especially, what is the wind looking like? You don't want to spend a lot of time, money, and effort trying to get somewhere only to find that the helicopter can't land or the site snowed in. So a weather station we found is really helpful. If you look at the quote at the bottom, we are looking into weather stations at our comm sites. That benefits our department by giving us a view of the conditions at a remote site before we even try to dispatch people. Instead of six hours to find out you can't install something because winds are too high or there's too much snow or whatever the condition is out there, we don't waste that trip. Number six, you have to know when legacy technology becomes a liability and sometimes when it's an opportunity. You might be expecting me to say, replace all your old devices, buy brand new ones. Well, you don't really necessarily want to do that. If they're still working, if they're still getting the job done, and they're just seeing problems because protocols are changing, there actually are ways that you can keep those online, maintain your investment, and over the course of maybe five years, gracefully transition. That's why when you do install new monitoring systems, you want to choose them that are flexible. Look for multiple protocols that are supported because you want to be able to bring the old and the new together. If you choose a system where they're trying to sell you on their protocol, it's trouble because now you're in a trap. If you buy a master station that only supports one protocol, you're stuck. You have to use that RTU and you're not going to be able to bring your older stuff and the new stuff together. And finally, don't buy faster than you can install. Don't just go in one day and buy a bunch of RTUs and then have them sitting on the shelf for a long time because oddly enough, those might actually be halfway to obsolete before you even get them installed. So buy some things, find something you like, and make sure you have a manufacturer that can reliably provide them, but then order them at a reasonable pace that matches how fast your teams can install things. Number seven, monitor your tower lights. It's pretty simple. You want to know if the lights are on, the lights are off, or if you need to go out and replace something. We heard one of our rail clients tell us that we have two microwave towers with FAA required lighting. The RTU monitors the lights for us. They give us real time information if the lights go on at night and turn off in the day or if a light bulb burns out. Number eight, you want to leverage automatic alarm notifications and have escalation. You want to send notifications to your phone for your alarms. You don't want to be stuck in the office. You want, if you're out at a site, you want to know if something changes before you leave the site, or maybe you're near another site and something's going on there. You don't want to come drive two hours back to the central office only to find out, oh, that place I was 15 minutes away from that was having trouble two hours back. When you do get a message remotely across your team, you want the person who gets it to either acknowledge it promptly to say, yes, I've got it, or within five minutes or 10 minutes, that notification should escalate to someone else and someone else. That way nothing can go unnoticed. And finally, you want to choose your alarms carefully to avoid desensitization. If you make everything an alarm and everything's a 10 on the scale of one to 10, that's a problem because people are going to get tired very quickly. You need to filter out the big things from the little things. And if something can wait till morning, have it wait till morning. The system can be smart enough to determine that. But if it is an emergency, well, then text everybody and get all hands on deck because it is an emergency. But everything is not a 10. Be sure you can differentiate. Something I heard one of our rail clients tell us was, if people in the office don't acknowledge an alarm within a certain length of time, the system will notify everybody out in the field. 
management, supervisors, technicians to know what's happening in their areas. We're looking to take the Alarm Master's email functionality and tie it into the company's email system. This would provide notification to all of our techs as needed. And that's pretty key too. Most email systems can set up distribution lists, route one message to large groups of people, and that you can tie into your master so that you might notify technical group or security group. And that might go to several different people depending on who are on those teams. Number nine, plan for reasonable future growth. You want to choose remotes that accommodate your forecasted growth for a few years. If you know you need 16 contact closures, don't buy an RTU that just does 16. You want at least 20, maybe 24, could even do 32 if you're really ambitious. But at the same time, don't waste your budget on overkill. You don't want to buy something that you're never going to use. So if you choose RTUs that can actually expand, for example, if you have, say, you need 28 discrete contact closure points, and you have an RTU that supports 32, but it also has the ability to add an expansion shelf and add another 32 points, you can probably go with that one because if you ever do get above 32, you can add the expansion shelf. So that kind of flexibility can be handy. One client told me, a small office might only have six alarm points, so a small remote would cover it for right now. But you might want to put in a larger RTU with more capacity to handle the alarms you anticipate having in a year's time. So that's really key. Give yourself a couple years. Try to forecast a little bit. You don't want to go overkill but you do want to make sure you have some room for growth. Okay, number 10, this is pretty big picture. You want to be sure you plan your goals first and then make your budget concessions. Don't let the price dictate everything. Start with what you really want to achieve and then pare it back to make it realistic. So you got to ask yourself, what are you really trying to accomplish? What is the equipment that's going to get you there? And be sure you consider things that are a little bit intangible, like reliability, easy configuration, and usability. You got to get beyond basic price because the bulk of the expense of a new monitoring system isn't in buying the equipment. It's all of the hassle of installing it and being able to get support, configuring it, and being able to use it on a day-to-day -day basis. So if those things aren't solid, I don't care how cheap it was, it ended up being very expensive. You just didn't recognize it. The quote at the bottom, my first concern is the technical capability. Does it have the capacity and provide the proper functionality to do what we need? If we look at the budget first, we're limiting ourselves. I look for reliability, ease of use and configuration, and also for equipment that can be used in a variety of environments for different applications. The last tip, number 11, how will you learn how to use your system? Where's the tech support based? You know, are you calling overseas somewhere? Is somebody reading off of a checklist? Is this a group of seasoned engineers? Who are you talking to? And is the tech support free? That's a big one. It's always so painful to, to whip out your credit card while you're trying to get support and it's $100 an hour. Or you get the first hour for free and then they have to hang up on you because you got to call back and, and buy a service plan. Really, you should be able to get free support. Any manufacturer who stands behind their product is going to offer some tech support for free. And finally, are you able to get training? If it's a complex system, really, master stations especially, and can you get training on that equipment? And do you have to pay for it? So DPS will offer free training. We do it about eight times a year. So look for that because it does exist. I talked at the beginning about telecom sites versus track side cabinets, and most of the tips are pretty universal. You'd scale the system. You might choose a smaller RTU for a small cabinet and maybe choose one with an industrial temperature rating because the, the temperature might not be controlled inside the cabinet. But in general, most of what I described is true for both. Some key differences. Temperature control, as I say, if the cabinet's not controlled, you're going to need to have some kind of highly rated. Our industrial temperature on our RTUs will usually go up to 158 and down to negative 30, negative 40, somewhere in that range. You want to consider available rack space, too, because cabinets can get pretty tight. So you might want something that mounts on a DIN rail instead of in a traditional rack mount. Maybe something that can wall mount to the door. We've seen a lot of that where people put it on the inside of the door so it really consumes zero rack units of space. Consider the amount of gear. So a cabinet might not need as big an RTU purely because there's just not as much stuff out there to monitor. The type of gear. Is it going to output Modbus because it's a generator? Is it going to output contact closures? What kinds of things are you monitoring? And the attractiveness to thieves. You might find that certain kinds of sites just look like they've got better stuff in them. So if you've got a building that looks like a big treasure chest, that one might see some more action than a little cabinet that doesn't look like much. So consider that when you're planning out what kind of security monitoring, whether it's door sensors or motion, that you want to deploy. 
So that's a quick introduction to remotely monitoring your sites. If you'd like to learn more, you can always go to our website at www.dpstele.com. You can also send me an email at sales at dpstele.com, or you can also call me, Andrew Erickson, at 1-800-693-0351. You can also check out some of my other YouTube videos. I try to keep the channel full of new and interesting things that we're developing at DPS. And if you'd like to, you can subscribe to get all the latest videos popping up in your feed.